Greetings, sisters and brothers. It's Milton Alimadi, publisher of Black Star News. Visit blackstarnews.com. I'm also an adjunct professor of African history at John Jay College of Criminal Justice here in New York City. And you can reach me at malimadi at gmail.com. It's M-A-L-L-I-M-A-D-I. I want to speak today on Donald Trump's comments last Thursday, questioning why do we even have immigrants from shithole countries coming to the United States instead of immigrants from Norway? And he was referring specifically to Haiti, El Salvador, and African countries. And in the past, he's also said, why do we have Nigerians coming here? Because after all, they will never want to go back to their huts in Africa. So first of all, obviously, his comments demonstrate his consistent pattern of racism. So in terms of his racism, that is not even an issue of debate anymore. People who still believe this man is not a racist are not serious. So that's not something we need to spend any time debating. Another point, Donald Trump wants to divert attention from the recent book, Fire and Fury, which shows how he's completely, utterly incompetent and not suitable to be president of the United States. And that in fact, he did not even expect to win. He just wanted all the publicity. And then after his defeat, he would then go back and use that elevated name recognition to make more money in his personal business. So he had no expectation, even his top advisors, and even his own wife, Melania, uh, she wept, not with joy, but out of sheer terror and disappointment that the wrong thing happened and her husband became president of the United States. And he's shown his incompetence in the last year. Instead of handling the national serious issues of state, because he's not capable, he's not equipped, he's always finding diversions and he's always finding people to insult and people to pick on. If it's not Latinos, calling Mexicans rapists, drug dealers, um, it's picking on the African-American population, calling people that were protesting, kneeling during the National Football League games, uh, son of a bitch. Uh, and he knows that plays very well to the hardcore racist that uh, support him in this country. So now to divert attention from fire and fury, another convenient scapegoat, the shithole countries. So let's not even debate about how completely incompetent and racist this president is. Let's focus a little bit about the history so we can use this as a teachable or teaching opportunity. You can start by watching Philippe Diaz, The End of Poverty. And in this documentary, Philippe Diaz shows remarkably very well how the West built its foundation for the Industrial Revolution and the wealth that the West enjoys today by plundering resources from Africa, from Asia, from South America, committing genocide during the process. It's a documentary that's available either on YouTube or you can even check it out from the New York Public Library. It's available, I know it, because I actually showed it to my students at John Jay. So I recommend that one. Another documentary you can watch is Africa Voyage of Discovery. It's a series that's also available on YouTube, or you could also rent that from the New York Public Library, and that's by the late uh, Professor Basil Davidson. And there's some books that I recommend as well. Uh, Cheke Antadiop, the late Professor Antadiop, a Senegalese, uh, The African Origins of Civilization. And there's a documentary, African Origins, based on an interview with the late Professor Diop, and that is also available on YouTube. So I strongly recommend that. Uh, so uh, Dr. Diop and Professor Davidson will give you a bit of the history, the background, 
the African origin of mankind, and ancient African civilizations as well. So those are good sources to start off with. And then you can read any of the books by Professor John Henry Clark, the late Professor John Henry Clark, who was very instrumental in getting uh, Professor Dio published in the United States. And then you can read Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, to show you how after European countries met in Berlin, the Berlin Conference 1884-85, partitioned the African countries. At that conference, King Leopold of the Belgians said, I want my piece of the African cake. And they usurped Africa's economies and turned it into the service of enriching Europe's economies. Africans became uh, providers of uh, mineral resources, natural resources, and producers of what they call cash crops, which were taken to Europe, used into manufacturing uh, processes, and then sold back <laughs> to Africans at a very inflated price. So for example, in the Portuguese colonies of Mozambique and Angola, Africans were forced under slave-like working conditions to produce cotton, taken to Portugal, turned into clothes, and sold back to uh, uh, people in the colonies at a tremendously inflated price, meaning Portugal was becoming richer and richer while the uh, people, Africans in the colonies remained impoverished. And in fact, when the uh, crops failed or when there was a collapse in the global price of commodities, there would be famines and hundreds of thousands of Africans died because while they were growing these cash crops, they were prevented from growing food crops that they could actually eat. And you can multiply this scenario, duplicate it in the other colonies across the African continent, the French colonies, the British colonies, the Belgian colonies, uh, Germany's uh, colonies, Italian colonies, all these colonial powers exploited Africa's labor and Africa's economy for the benefit of Europe. As Walter Rodney said, colonialism was a one-armed bandit. And he said, all roads or railways led to the sea, meaning all these infrastructures built were not even built to empower Africa or to facilitate growth. They were built directly to the sources where the raw materials or the mineral wealth were located, and then they were shipped to the coast and taken uh, to Europe. So that was the economic model that was set up. And it's not as if Africans did not resist. Africans resisted colonization and they fought, uh, and they were evenly matched initially. Uh, Europeans initially came with muskets. African had muskets, they had traditional weapons. So Europe was not able to conquer Africa until the last 20 years of the 19th century with the invention of the Maxim gun in 1883 by Hiram S. Maxim. That changed the equation tremendously. Maxim gun is a prototype of the modern machine gun. So that really put Africa at a great disadvantage and enabled the colonization of Africa. So after formal colonialism, uh, collapse in the 1960s, uh, there was decolonization, and there were a few African countries that tried to break from the model, where the dependency model, but they paid a heavy price. So for example, in the Congo, Patrice Lumumba, when he tried to change that model of dependency and wanted an economic system whereby Congo would be able to benefit from its vast natural resources, uh, the estimated resource endowment of the Congo is $27 trillion. <laughs> and yet today in the 21st century, Congo's uh, per capita income is about $1,500, while the United States that depends on much of the resources from the other parts of the world, its per capita income is $57,000 plus. So anyway, Kwame, uh, I mean, uh, Patrice Lumumba was murdered with the help of the Central Intelligence Agency. The Belgians did not want to uh, part from all the resources of the Congo. So after independence in 1960,
Patrice Lumumba was uh, overthrown within three months, and then the next year in 1961, he was killed in Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, when he tried to change that dependency model by focusing on industrialization, because that's truly the only way to build wealth and prosperity when Africa uses its resources to build its own industry. And when he tried to do that, uh, what happened? He met the similar fate. He was overthrown again with the involvement of the Central Intelligence Agency. What happened in the 1980s when young Thomas Sankara became the leader in Burkina Faso and wanted to promote uh, independent economy, economic structure. He wanted the people, the Bukinabe, as the people are called, to grow their own food, to uh, build their own domestic industries, to stop importing clothes since they know how to grow cotton to make their own clothes. And he set the example by wearing domestically produced uh, clothes. And he also told African leaders that let's renounce this tremendous debt burden that is holding us back and preventing us from developing. He said, I can't do it alone. If I do it alone, they're going to kill me. But sure enough, they did not follow his lead and he was killed. Uh, the French instigated uh, division and promoted the assassination of Sankara by his supposed best friend, uh, Blaise Campaure. I'm happy to say it took 27 years, but Blaise Campaure himself was ultimately deposed when, uh, inspired by the memory of Sankara's legacy, the youth in Burkina Faso uh, drove him out of town. So those are some of the challenges. And also I wanna go back to the resistance period because sometimes there's this misconception, uh, people that are not familiar, that Africans did not fight colonization. As I said, the Maxim gun made the difference. But before that, Africans fought valiantly. Uh, Samori Ture in West Africa, for example, defeated the French in many, many battles until ultimately he could not get the weapons that he had been getting from the British to fight the French. Uh, the British betrayed him, and ultimately he was uh, defeated and captured. But in uh, Ethiopia, under Empress Taitu and Emperor Menelik, an outright defeat of an invading Italian army of 17,000 at the Battle of Adwa, March 1, 1896, an army of 17,000 commanded by five Italian generals and other senior officers defeated completely in one day. 5,000 killed, more than 2,000 captured. So there was great, many examples of African resistance to colonization. Africa's challenge is this. The economic system that was set up during colonial rule still exists today. Africa remains the provider of raw materials to the West, and they use these resources to build wealth and prosperity in their countries. And now China is a new player on the African scene as well, acting like a new colonial power in the post-colonial era, using Africa's resources for the uh, prosperity, building wealth and prosperity in China. Africans need to learn the lesson that was preached by Kwame Nkrumah. If Africans do not unite and come together and control their sovereignty, and then from there be able to control their resources for the benefit of Africans. After independence will be the same as before independence. And that's the condition that exists in African countries today. The Western countries don't favor African leaders that take care of African interests. That's why they promoted uh, Mobutu, in the Congo for almost 40 years, while it was plundering resources, but allowing Western companies access to resources. And today, in the 21st century, we have another Mobutu in the form of Yoweri Museveni in Uganda, playing the same role that Mobutu did in the 1960s and 1970s. So what the uh, slur by Donald Trump should do is just inspire Africans to continue resisting neo-colonial conditions. And ultimately, one day Africans will realize the dream and vision that Kwame Nkrumah had for Africa, Africa unity.
Thank you, sisters and brothers.